Hello, I'm Alexia. Let me help you to take the fear out of birth with a mix of real-life positive birth stories and birthing experts sharing their wisdom. I'll also be sharing tips to help you get into the fearless mindset. Fear Free Childbirth is the online destination for women seeking to take the fear out of birth with fear clearance meditations, online fear clearance courses and programmes for overcoming tocophobia. Find out more at fearfreechildbirth.com. Hello and welcome back to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leachman. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now, on today's show, I'm going to be talking all about body, body image, body changes, all that kind of stuff. And to help me, I'm going to be chatting with Natasha and Bianca from Babo Mio. Now, they are total birth junkies. They've been training doulas, working with pregnant women, running birth centres for forever and they know a lot about this kind of stuff. Um, So they are perfect for discussing anything to do with the body and all the changes that women go through as part of pregnancy and birth and how we feel about those changes. During my chat with Bianca and Natasha we talk about so much around body image. So for example whether or not you're overweight or underweight the impact of BMI and the risks associated with that and what your healthcare providers may or may not tell you about those risks. We also talk about yo-yo dieting, but also if you are, you know, if you're a gym fanatic and love to train and what that means for your body and how maybe you need to adapt post-birth. But we also talk about whether or not you can have a fat vagina, because apparently that is a thing that people hear a lot. I love that your vagina is too fat. What kind of nonsense is that? But we talk about that. And we also talk about tearing, the damage that can happen down below, the fear of having damage to your body that so many women experience, the, you know, vaginal tearing, episiotomies, all that kind of stuff. Um, So yeah, it really is all about body. This is a great episode that touches on so many important issues that I'm sure you're going to love it. But before I go over to that, I do want to remind you about the webinar that I'm running very, very soon. And this webinar is for birth workers. So I'm talking doulas, midwives, um, therapists, uh, pregnancy coaches, birth coaches, uh, yoga teachers. I don't know anybody that, that supports women in preparing for birth. And so the reason I'm doing this is because since my book came out, Fearless Birthing, I've been getting a lot of emails from people asking me how can they best support the women that they that they work with, that come into contact with them as a result of doing work around pregnancy and birth, and specifically those women who are fearful. So I'm getting a lot of doulas getting in touch, asking about how best to support women with tocophobia, for example. So what I want to do is really just sort of hold a webinar and just answer all those questions and share my own experiences of working with women um, and supporting them to have a fear-free birth. So if you are a birth worker and you want to join the call, then just go to the fearfreechildbirth.com website on the homepage. There's a great big pink banner that you have to click on. Um, If you don't see the pink banner, it means you've missed it, right? So there's a pink banner all over the website where you can click and sign up for the webinar. So yeah, so that is basically fearless birthing for Birth Workers, the webinar that will be running on November the 7th, 2018. So if you're listening to this podcast before November the 7th, 2018, then yay, happy dance. You can still make it if if, if that date has passed, then oops, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) Anyway, okay, back to today's episode. So I'm joined by Natasha and Bianca from Baby Mio, and we talk about everything about the body and the changes to the body, But importantly, we're going to talk about fat vaginas. So I hope you enjoy this chat. It really is a good one. Enjoy. Welcome, Natasha and Bianca, to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Now, we are going to be talking about such an important topic, which is around body image and how we feel about how our body is and changes during pregnancy. But, and I'm so excited to talk about this, but before we dive into all that, Natasha, would you mind just introducing yourself and then we'll go on to Bianca so we can get to know a little bit more about who you guys are and why you're here on the podcast, talking about what we're going to talk about today. Hi, I'm Natasha. I've been a birth doula for longer than a decade. I'm also a hypnotherapist, similar to you, which is why we were so drawn to your podcast. I've been teaching aqua fitness for a long time. I train doulas. I don't know what else do I do. (laughs) I do so many things. Um, Yeah, I just love to learn and 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 teach and whatever I can do so mm. that's who I am and Bianca 
Um, hi everybody, I'm Bianca, and I am the other half of Babo Mia here with Natasha. Um, I'm also a birth doula. Um, I find the psycho-emotional aspects of birth just fascinating and creating those safe spaces. And for the last um, seven years, Natasha and I have been training other doulas, um, as well as we've expanded to have a business community, and we've moved online, and we get to just support birth workers around the world and it's beyond exciting where we're at right now that's brilliant so um you said you, you got together working together what seven years ago you put yourselves together to create your business is that right um, actually it's been longer <laughs> it, was, it was over 10 years ago we met each other on the board of directors um here for a doula organization and uh we just we we both had our own independent doula businesses and we decided to meld them together because we thought wouldn't it be great because she's we're kind of polar opposites of each other. Like the things that I do are very different what, from what she d does. So we were like, if we blend it together, then we'd be able to offer so much like fertility and pregnancy and parenting support in the city. So we started out for the first couple of years working solely with pregnant women um, or women who are trying to conceive or new moms. Um, and then just kind of organically, our, our business grew quite large and other people, soon to be doulas or people who wanted to be doulas started asking us like how do I get to do what you do um and yeah organically we started training doulas and that was probably around seven years ago oh brilliant brilliant so now you train them <laughs> online we do we used to have a chain of centers we're in Toronto in Canada and we had um a chain of pre and postnatal fitness centers as well as our main center where we did our you know hypnobirthing and breastfeeding prep classes etc um, and Natasha's husband actually got transferred to the west coast of Canada, so they had to move 4,000 kilometers away. Um, so we were like, ooh, we got to go back to the drawing board on our <laughs> business because we're going to be quite far apart now. So um, we closed all of our brick and mortar, which was, you know, scary and sad, and we cried a lot. <laughs> a, bit, a bit drastic. It was a bit drastic. <laughs> and then um, we moved exclusively online, um, only to find Natasha moved home like a year later. <laughs> So we were like, well, this works now. Yeah, so yeah, we moved ourselves, all of our stuff online. There was a huge learning curve, as I'm sure you know all mm. about that learning curve. Like, how do you set up podcasts and how do you set up classes online and all of that? We learned all of that over the year. Um, and our first training went over like hotcakes. Like, we had so many people attending. It went over so well. It was three months long. People felt like it was, they learned so much because it was three months long, right? And we were with them the whole time. Like, nobody felt like it was lacking because it was online, which is something we were so worried about. Yeah. Um, and it ended up being like such a blessing. And we were able to reach people like, in small town Canada where they would like never be able to get to a training and so it made it accessible for people it made it more affordable for, pe for people and it was it was fabulous um, so when I moved back a year later we we didn't change it brilliant no that sounds brilliant I love I love all this online stuff and yeah like you I'm doing a lot of that online community stuff and I get it means that a lot of women like you say a lot of people can access it that don't have that aren't living in those big towns that mean they can access this great information and this learning so it's brilliant so yeah, anyway, I'm just giving you a big high five. And by the way, for those people that can't see, which they won't be able to see because this is a podcast, is we both have the same microphone, which I really, really like. <laughs> we both got the I same know, microphone. but we don't have that cool filter. No, yeah, no you we have haven't got cooler. one cool. Yeah, yeah, well, I know, I know. You took it up a notch. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we're going to, so let's talk about the body piece then. So what is it that, um, with your work, with with the work that you do, and obviously the extensive experience that you've had over the years working with women and birth and pregnancy, what is it about the, what's the first thing you'd like to sort of talk about in terms of the body piece, the, uh, I don't know, you know, what's the first thing that you think people, that women worry about when it comes to that sort of body piece, the shape, the weight, the, all that kind of stuff? What's the first thing? Well, I think a big thing is that they're worried about their body, like what they look like. You know, it's just like now their body changes in ways they've never expected. And especially if your body changes in a way that's, you know, quote unquote, n not normal, <laughs> like <laughs> not the way you see in magazines and on TV and with the superstars and all of that. So, so like, for example, me, I'm pregnant right now and like my bump doesn't grow forward in this beautiful little bump I kind of grow sideways like it's like my baby's lying sideways I get wider and it you know like it's those little things like okay now my shoulders feel bigger or my feet feel bigger it's all these little things that you don't expect um and and people worry about that like why don't I get to have a pregnancy that looks like this glorious glowing 
beautiful tiny baby bump. Instead, I'm swelling, and you know, I think that's one of the biggest pieces is is their perception of their themselves once they become pregnant, and their their self image changes, and their confidence might wane because their body looks different or feels different. Um, I think that's a, a big thing. I know Bianca and I have been. She was saying we have the fitness centers too, so. We have women that are coming to our fitness classes or we're coming to our fitness classes because they're too scared to gain um, over the 25 pounds or, you know, whatever it is mm. that they, has been prescribed to them. And they're working out in a way that's like, I want to work out because I don't want to gain this extra weight because of how it looks on the outside. And where we got this 25 pounds, like that's the like healthy for a singleton baby um, and it, it goes up just a little bit, even for if, once you get into twins and then triplets, um, with a cap at about 40 pounds. And one of our favorite questions in, in our in our doula course is to ask women, how much weight did you put on if you feel comfortable sharing? And we, you know, we have 120 women in the program and we'll get everything from seven pounds to like 110 pounds. Yeah. And it's like, you know, these are all women that would say, describe themselves. I mean, some would say they, they didn't feel healthy about their pregnancy, but for the most part, the women, because they're so passionate about babies and bellies and everything to do with birth, that they, these were women who were active and eating well. And that's what their body did is it put on 65 pounds, which is, you know, almost triple from the prescribed, like 25 yeah. healthy. Yeah. And regard, it's almost regardless too, because some will say, you know, I. Uh, I, I worked out three days a week. I ate as healthy as I could, um, and still I gained thirty, you know, sixty-five pounds. And then the next pregnancy, she's like, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to eat what I want. I'm going to walk, you know, whatever, um, and still gain sixty-five pounds, right? So it didn't matter. It's just how their body takes on pregnancy, mm -hmm. and trying to fit it into this like little box of twenty-five pounds, it just sets a lot of people up for failure, really. Yeah. And there's also there's the baby's needs as well. I noticed that for me, I mean, and they all say that every pregnancy is different and that's so true. But that's because there's a different little human being growing inside with very different needs and personalities <laughs> and whatever. And I know that I put a ton more weight on with my second and I just needed. And also, yeah, yeah. Um, I also I breastfed um, my, my, I had more milk, but she was an absolute guzzler and her appetite now is huge. And I'm like, no wonder <laughs> that I used to eat so much during that second pregnancy. But that, I look at that, I look at her now and I see it. I see why I did that because she made me do it. Whereas my first one didn't, you know. So I think, yes, it's how our body is reacting to pregnancy or how our body does pregnancy. But there's also that bit about the little creature inside that's growing and what their needs are and how they need, what, what they need to grow and flourish and thrive. So there's so many moving parts here that you're right, you know, having this little box for everyone to grow in, not grow in, but fit into is so restrictive and damaging on that, on that whole self worth scale that self-worth scale is huge yeah and it just it's a continuation of what we're doing to women specifically like in life is just being like this is what you have to look like this is what you have to do to get there and it's it can be so damaging because in pregnancy this is where you're you're meant to like you know love yourself and take care of yourself and do things because of that or because of a healthy for healthy reasons right so you know while before pregnancy, you might be, you know, for example, yo-yo dieting, which a lot of us have done and will continue to do um, to try to fit into this box. That's that's a practice that you don't want to take into pregnancy, right? You don't want to be eating like really low calorie foods to not gain weight because you your baby needs nourishment. So shifting yourself from being like in this dieting from this dieting idea to feeding yourself and moving around because you because you want to take good care of yourself. So if we can talk to pregnant women in that way rather than like only gain 25 pounds, it's going to shift how we how we care for ourselves during pregnancy and might actually shift how we care about our body even after. So what about those then that are maybe overweight to start with, where they might have a, they might feel like, overweight. There's a, there's a, there's a, I'm just walking into sort of dodgy ground as already just using that word because what is overweight anyway? You know, without, now we're talking about sort of BMI ratings that doesn't, you know, and, and, and whether or not who says what is overweight. So I, I kind of don't want to sort of tread too, go too far that, that, that kind of dodgy ground but for those that know that they they that they feel maybe they're they're again again i feel like you know the whole weight thing is so problematic if i say they feel they're bigger than they should be you have girls that are sticks that feel they're bigger than they should be help me out here what's the best yeah, way of, i know do you know what i mean like talking about this is so tricky isn't it 
<laughs> it's so tricky. Well, unfortunately, most of us are weighed, well, everybody can be weighed on the BMI scale. And the BMI scale is so rudimentary, though, because all it takes is two measurements, your height and your weight, and gives you a number. And I mean, Natasha is five feet tall, and I'm almost six feet tall. <laughs> And so, like, and muscle weighs more than fat. Like, there's so many variables, and then they just spit out a number. And and we laughed about this because my wife, you know, she's she feels that she's a little bit overweight. Um, but on the scale, she's almost considered obese. But if you saw her, like, she's a she's athletic and she's average height and average weight. But because of the flawed scale, she comes up as as obese, as on the cusp of overweight and obesity, which you mm. would like laugh if you saw her, like. It, it's just ridiculous. So these women are, are called obese because of their height and weight is yes, spat out a number. Um, and, and unfortunately, in North America especially, um, they are given a health care provider specifically for obese women that automatically put them into a high-risk, high-intervention track for their birth. Yeah, it depends on where you are in the scale. So it, for the BMI scale, there's kind of like the norm, quote-unquote normal weight or the healthy weight. And then it goes to obese and then another level of obese and another level of obese, which is like, I feel like obese is the worst word ever. Like you could, anybody can call their body whatever they like to call it, but I hate that word. Yeah. And so... If you the higher you get on the obese category, the higher risk um, mm. you're considered, and it might change your care through your pregnancy. Um, but the important thing to note, like Bianca is saying, is that it actually is not much of an indicator of how healthy you are. So, for example, I'm in the obese category because I'm five feet tall. I gain weight very easily, but I'm also very healthy. I eat well. I walk a lot. I exercise. Whereas when I was in the normal range or the you know, average range, I was far less healthy. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I was doing things to my body I shouldn't have been doing to be, you know, skinnier. Um, I was exercising too much. I was not eating enough. Like I'm far healthier now. So the BMI scale really doesn't yeah. tell you who's healthy and who's not. And you don't want to end up in a high risk category if you're a healthy person. It's yeah. the APGAR of weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> when they decide to put you in a high risk category then because of this this rating, let's sort of look at it from a different perspective then. What is it about being overweight? Uh, is there a point where there are risks to uh, pregnancy yeah. and birth from having too much weight on your body? Yeah, so it Typically, like in, in this general scale, is anybody who's in the obese category, which is a body mass index of 30 and above, mm. um, the risk there are risks, and they're very true risks, and they they get higher as as the the number gets higher of your mm. BMI. Um, but it by no means is an absolute that if you're in this category or if you're in this bucket, that all of these high risk things are going to happen to you. There's just a, a higher chance. So for example, you there's a higher chance of gestational diabetes, but not by much. It doesn't mean you're going to have gestational diabetes. Mm. You know, there's a higher chance of C-sections, but not by much. It, it means it could happen, but likely not. So if you're talking to a healthcare provider and they're saying things like, oh, you know, you're in this category, so you're going to have gestational diabetes, you'll likely have a cesarean section. You know, that's not the right healthcare provider for you because that's not that's not true for one, and it's not what's recommended by the SOGC at all. Like, positive outcomes are absolutely possible um, for plus size pregnancies, mm. like a hundred percent. You know, the the risks just elevate slightly. So, when you say positive outcomes, are you talking um, home birth, natural birth, um, um, vaginal birth? Is that what you're talking about in terms of positive all of outcomes? the above? All of the yeah, above. all of the above. Yeah. So if you if you really want, it, it really depends on what you want for your mm. birth, right? Like that's going to yeah. be up to each individual person. But if you wanted to have a natural home birth, you could. Um, it you know depending it, it depending on what comes up for you during your pregnancy, but by no means does being a plus size pregnancy mean there's no chance of that happening. Mm. So some healthcare writers will say that they'll say, you know what, you're plus size. There's a very good chance you're going to have a cesarean section. We're going to do this. We're going to change your birth plan based on that. You know, when really you have to kind of see how it goes, right? Like she mm -hmm. might have a perfectly healthy pregnancy and give birth very easily and naturally at home. Mm -hmm. um, so if putting them in a high-risk box when there's no reason yet 
is can be quite damaging and it's not great for our self-image either no 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 and i i just hear a lot of parallels with i was put in a high-risk box for being an older mum because i was on my due date i was two weeks past my 40th birthday and it's like we have like eat well I, I i exercise i'm not overweight i don't have had a great pregnancy so why am i you know again it's this sort of stupid box approach where you just get lumbered in a category just because protocol says you are not because they're looking at the person in front of them so yeah. what I'm hearing is a very similar story when it comes to the weight issue. And that if you're having it, you've got a healthcare provider that's kind of just lumping you in there and telling you it's going to go like this because you're in that box. It's actually to find one that is looking at you as for the human being that you are and to look beyond the, what, the, the categorization and look at other factors like your lifestyle factors, like, you know, your actual shape, whether or not you look like you're bulging out or whether or not you look like you're athletic, you know, just sort of a little bit of common sense. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, for sure. And, and the the things that are said to our plus size clients, like a lot of it comes down to the fact that there's a belief that because you're overweight, you're a not going to be strong enough to actually push out your baby, which is a huge assumption because some women have an incredibly strong core, even if they, they are plus size women. Um, and that I don't know if it happens in the UK, but in Canada, we've had clients be told that their vagina will be too fat for the baby to pass through because they're too overweight and it's like Natasha and I laugh about this at least once a week about being yeah. told you have a fat vagina like I didn't, yeah. can you get a fat vagina that's what we, we were that a thing? this we were like I don't yeah. think there's the type of cells there that could get fat and it's a hole like it's it's not a thing yeah it's the absence of a thing <laughs> where we landed yeah no it's it's you know I think I think what they're trying to say in in and this is one of the big problems is that you need to know as like if you're plus size and you're going into a pregnancy and you're you're talking to healthcare providers, you need to know your information. You need to advocate for yourself. So like reach out to doulas that are plus size friendly. Like do whatever you can to find out what is true and what's not. Um, because if they say to you, you have a fat vagina and you're not going to be able to push out your baby, you're likely inclined to believe them. You're, they're your healthcare provider. But if you know the truth, um, that that's not a thing. Or if they're talking about something like shoulder dystocia, find out the real stats. Like... That's a, there's a very small percentage of people that actually end up with shoulder dystocia and being um, plus size is not one of the indicators. So know that and then and then you'll be able to say like, I don't know about this healthcare provider. It's not, he's not really or she's not really giving the right information. Yeah, no, everything you said there is just so brilliant because it's absolutely true. And it just goes for everything. All aspects of being labeled high risk is do your research find the evidence so that you can go into those meetings when they're starting to sort of railroad you into a certain direction and go, you know what, I've read the research too and it doesn't say that and I'm, I, yeah. I'm, I'm disagreeing. I need you to show me what you're taking this from because if you can't demonstrate to me that what you're saying is evidence-backed and what I have got here is, then we've, you know, it, it's my way, honey, not your way. So uh, <laughs> you know, you've just got to be up front, haven't you? And even certain things like for us here, like our governing, our governing bodies don't agree with like, induction or c-section or any of that because of plus size so um if you know that and your healthcare provider is saying you know what we're going to do induce on this date because you're plus size that's not a recommendation so like where's this coming from so um now the other aspect of um the whole body image piece as well is is i think you know let's sort of abandon the plus size people for a moment and we're not doing this in a bad way but maybe just go to the the the, the fit gym bunnies for a minute and how they feel about losing their fit bunny look. You know, you've got the women that really spend a lot of time and effort eating well, smoothies, juices, chia puddings, whatever they're doing. And now suddenly they're, you know, they're facing their body changing and they can't control it. It's out of their control. And maybe they're slight control freaks because they, that's one thing they can control is go to the gym every day for two hours and do their thing. And suddenly they're facing this, this natural process that's basically kiboshing their, their, their success at maintaining their amazing figure. What about women like that then? Do you, what, what experience have you got of women like that and how they might handle that situation? You know what, I, I, as doulas, you know, one of the biggest pieces is being able to hear what they're saying. Um, and, and give them the, the opportunity to grieve what they thought their body would look mm. like during pregnancy. Like, that's a total thing. Um, you know, for them to feel that way is totally normal and, like, letting them know that. Um, you know, I, I don't want to 
tell anyone, you know what, how you feel about your body is wrong in any way. So I like to just be an open ear and listen to them. And if that's how they feel, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, I'm happy to listen, but also also letting them know that the things that they are doing, like going to the gym a bit, um, eating really well, all of that stuff, even if your body is changing in ways you didn't expect, you're still very strong and confident and, mm. and your body is is able to give birth and all of the things that are really mm. important um, for a pregnancy. Like I try, I, we try our best to build confidence in other ways that are not surrounded around what your body looks like but more like what your body is doing can do yeah um yeah but also not taking away from the fact that yeah we are all kind of brought up to feel shamey around our bodies which sucks yeah and and one of the other pieces with um women that we work with who would fall into that like you know their body and what it looks like is really important to them um is is a lot of support around making sure that they give themselves the six weeks after so we've had, um, you know, professional athletes and professional dancers. Like I had a ballerina, one of our clients, she's, she danced for the National Ballet. It's so obviously the expectation for her to be back mm. to 95 pounds as fast as possible is really important. Um, but making sure that they do give their body that full six weeks at least before they start going back to training. And I'm always so disappointed when we go through our Instagram and we see these women who are like two weeks postpartum and they're like back power lifting with like their baby at their feet. And as cute as those pictures are, I'm like, ah, oh, your relaxing levels are still really high. Your organs aren't in the right place. You still have a little bit of anemia. It's very safe to say. I don't know any woman who's, you know, iron levels aren't still at a decline in the first four weeks. So like these, that's the part where it's like, just, you know, be okay. And like, if you're choosing to breastfeed, continue to do that. And that's, you know, like doing a two hour workout every day, um, like really stroking what they can do and like mm. working on their core breathing and like walking and just, you know, getting in touch with their postpartum body, which is very different. Um, and, and not doing that, like, okay, back to the gym, like, here you go. Yeah. Start start losing that baby weight, um, yeah. and I find that that's actually where there's more problems with yeah. these ridiculous yeah. expectations of you know celebrities being back to their pre baby weight within a month. Yeah, we actually we were reading an article the other day that was really interesting about Kim Kardashian um, and her pregnancy because she's one of the celebrities that people know really well. I mean, she's extremely popular, and she's had two very um, two pregnancies in the eyes of so many people and she didn't have that like little bump glowy thing that you know she really wanted and she grieved that for her pregnancy but also on the other on the flip side is we all got to see someone just have a regular pregnancy and and like looking at those kind of images like looking at other people that are not you know perfect yeah like on Instagram and stuff like that like there's other ways to be pregnant um and there's other ways to come back from pregnancy and getting your body back is a such a damaging I hate thing. that yeah. yeah the whole idea you've got to get it back it's, it's like you're trying to rewind time it's like what would you go back to a time when you haven't got your child I I am so grateful for what my body's done and what it's yeah. created that it's like well yeah it's had to kind of adapt and change because of that having said that I my belly that's slightly wobbly than I'd like it to be right now <laughs> but I, and, I, and that's just because I'm just being lazy and I'm not going to the gym I'm not training like I used to but yeah I've got kids so I'm not beating myself up about that but what I really love is that my youngest always reminds me she's always running up to my belly and holding it in her hands and going belly 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 <laughs> I love belly and like and it's like she knows she lived there she she keeps stroking it and kind of adore like you know worships it and it's like I'm, well, I, I thank you for doing that, sweetie, because you're reminding me that this is a sacred thing, that my belly is, was your home. You lived there. And yeah. and it, I'm grateful that she's doing that for me to help me kind of deal with my own belly issues, as it were. Even though I'm on a level, I kind of know I just got to let go of that because being a mum is so special and so wonderful and I wouldn't trade them for the world. And that means the body that, that grew them, you know. So, but yeah. yeah, getting your body back. I hate that with a vengeance. And I could rant about that for quite a while. I'm going to stop now. Do you want to rant about it instead? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's such a sweet way to look at it. Like, this is where your, your baby lived and like to have a, a child that loves it so much and like viewing it from that point of view is so nice and all the things that you see on Instagram of like stretch marks and um you know mummy tummies and all the stuff where people are proud of it like more of that please and yeah. then you know and then I think things will shift 
Yeah. But if, if Instagram continues to be like, you know, a power lifter with a three week old at her feet, yep. then, then it, the expectation, the expectation is still there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm managing not. expectations is a big piece. Yeah, I think the managing the expectations piece. And then yeah, that just reminds me of, you know, a great tenet in Buddhism, which is, you know, let go of all expectations of outcome. And if you can do that, which is not an easy thing to do by any means, but if you can let go of those expectations of outcome and be more present, you're less likely to beat yourself up on these body issues, I think. And and, and just be more mindful and appreciative of what you have. That even if you play the gratitude card and just be grateful that you've had a healthy pregnancy, that you've got a healthy baby, that you've, you know, that, you, it, that it went, that you've got a baby you know with so many women struggling with this that focus on all those things that you have got and yeah you know what the belly comes with the comes with the ride you know like that that's just part of the journey kind of thing and and those those kind of pieces can really help you to grow to appreciate what you have rather than maybe grieving or harking back to a time when you had time on your hands and you could sleep for four <laughs> eight hours a night and 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 to use your time as you wish you know to go to the gym and train that that time's gone you know and so sort of uh, get with the program of it and update where you're at with your life you know Is that, does that sound a bit harsh so, am I being a bit harsh no <laughs> it's just so hard it's so hard to do that like we I think everybody kind of wants to be like more balanced in their life and 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 happy with where they are with their body and really wish to feel that way but then you know you put on a top that doesn't fit quite right and like like it's all out the window yeah um so we all want to feel that way and then <laughs> it, little things can throw us right off track yeah. so certain things like like you do with the hypno like the hypnosis scripts like these would be great for somebody who's really trying to get back into that balance of loving their body and what it's done and you know those would be great ways to, I think, help with the self-image piece. I think Natasha just bossed you to make another script. I okay. know. Well, actually, I was just about to say, I'm just about to scribble down a little note yeah. to make a new fear clearance <laughs> I've meditation. I've had three months left of my pregnancy, so if you could get that done really quickly. I know. It's funny because I, I was going through my fear clearance meditation range, and I haven't added any new ones to the range for a while. And I was like, <laughs> the last one I did was fear of pooing and weeing, which I know is not very glamorous, but hey, it's a big fear that women have. But I think That's I should good. add, you know, fear of my body changing. Fear, and, and actually, while we're on it, fear fear of body becoming damaged through birth is, is a huge mm. one you know a lot of women have yeah. got that fear that they're going they're going and especially among the tocophobic women that they they just think their undercarriage is going to get completely destroyed and they're never ever going to be able to weep who or have sex ever again in their entire lives because of that, that and and the thing is that does happen to a small minority of people generally speaking that doesn't but that's a huge fear. I did a, a, a live Facebook live in my group recently on vaginal tearing, and it was so popular because vaginal tearing is such a big fear for a lot of yeah. women. And I think, you know, these things where you can't, it's difficult to talk about some of this stuff out in the open, especially with non-pregnant or uh-huh. women that are pre-childbearing. They, they <laughs> just don't get it in the same way, do they? They kind of look at you a little bit, you know. Um, yeah, how do you, you know, how to sort of help women handle that i mean do you come across any you know helping women in that way with the, maybe the vaginal tearing the fears of tearing or or recuperating when it comes to what's happened in birth well it's yeah i would say it's it's up in probably the top five fears that we see of our of our clients um it's interesting too i don't know if they if it's as popular in europe but i know there's the joke here where ob's will do they call it the husband stitch to actually like i've heard about that is see that just makes me yeah i hate i just that makes me so mad (laughs) oh yeah it's like super upsetting for me i get like my my lesbian feminist rage goes like just through through the just when you said it all my i just felt all my like (laughs) if i was porcupine my spikes went up at that point (laughs) just to sort of paint the picture but yeah that may and so does that really happen is that like is that an urban myth or is that a real thing it's a real thing. And and the um, vaginal rejuvenation surgery is, I mean, we live in Toronto, which is, you know, the biggest city in Canada. So we obviously get more of everything. Um, so it's really common here. Like there's clinics all through the nicer areas of the city where you, you know, a woman like, Shh, like only you'll know that like, you now have the vagina of a 12 year old girl again. Um, so it is really, really common here, unfortunately. And the messaging is is coming back too around not breastfeeding to protect the like the aesthetics of your breasts, which is really disappointing. I mean, women can choose to do whatever the heck they want with their bodies. We fully support your body, your choice, um, and we would love it to not be that messaging around a vanity issue versus, you know, what you want to do. What you want to do. Yeah. 
I, um, I, I had this question about the breastfeeding and whether or not that is, is does breastfeeding give you a saggy boob was my question I, and I wanted to know the answer to that and I spoke to a breastfeeding specialist recently for um, some some uh, an interview I've put into my membership area and she said and this is this is her word she said absolutely not the more you breastfeed the more you're helping your body to get back into its get get bring out all the stuff that gives you that firmness and that fleshiness what happens to the breast is what happens during pregnancy so any sagginess you might get she said it, it happens really during good. pregnancy not as, as a result of breastfeeding which yeah. um, which is good to know you know a lot of women do have that fear and maybe don't breastfeed because they're hearing that messaging so yeah when i heard that i was like that is really good to know and i wish more women would know that so that that didn't affect their desire or their their yeah that whether or not they choose to breastfeed or not because that really shouldn't be coming into the, the equation as far as i'm concerned no, we, we agree. Again, like, but we want to emphasize, ladies, whatever you choose to do with your body is your choice, and we fully yeah. support that. Um, but yeah, there is... We a, just don't want to make decisions on, like, myths, right? Like, yeah. that's yeah. kind of a big thing. Yeah. yeah, so base it on accurate information and what your gut's telling you and, you know, all of the using your brain. Um, but there is there is a fear of everything that happens during the bro- birth process and pregnancy you know, whether it is an episiotomy or, or a, a tear at the vagina or the perineum. And, um, you know, it, it is very much in the conversation as, around the fear of potentially even having a vaginal delivery or what it's going to look like. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, too, though, the our healthcare providers in Canada, especially, um, they don't do a lot of public floor protection. Um, so it is an area, and I know that you've, you've talked about this on the podcast, the importance of protecting your pelvic floor, because it is a really, really important dialogue because too many women are incontinent. Like childbirth does not mean you now are going to be, you know, peeing every time you sneeze, jump, cough, or laugh. Forever. Forever. So um, that it that is like it is hard because our our healthcare providers are not taking care of us the way that they should. They're too aggressive. They they're it's a ru- like rush things along. Um, our midwives are quite good at protecting the pelvic floor. So that's one thing we equip our clients with is like, you know how you know some people talk about oh my god pushing stage takes two hours and we're like that's actually a very good thing you know like you know talking about how birth happens and why it happens that way and why it's your body working for you not against you yeah so like it happens slowly to help stretching and your healthcare provider you know is there to help with the stretching and to apply um oils and you know whatever works and that's something our midwives really do do really well when when babies are on their way out and what are other things you can be doing to to build your confidence around the baby coming out which is such a huge fear so like Mm. can you do perineal massage can you um practice birth breathing can you like all of those things help build confidence i think that's kind of the angle where we come from um to like build confidence around the body and and the likelihood, we, we like to look more at like the likelihood of baby coming out and, and having no tears compared to like the odds of it happening. And one thing that I, I encourage the women that I work with to do is when you think about what your fears are, is just educate yourself on the thing that you're fearful of. Because the minute you start learning about something a lot more, it, you, you, kind of, you can reduce the fear quite significantly by understanding it. And, and again, I think the vaginal tearing piece is so, such a big piece to get your head around and to understand that, that maybe even if you do tear, actually it's not that big a deal in for many mm-hmm. women. And so maybe it's just not that worth fearing in that sense. But what you just need to understand, so I think education is such a great place to start when you have got some of these fears, can really help you. And I think that goes the same for what you're talking about, you know, just going back to what we were talking about at the beginning about being a high BMI rating. Again, so once you educate yourself and get the facts on the evidence, suddenly that can take away a lot of the fears that you might have about your own pregnancy and birth, that all the negative bombardment that you might be getting from your healthcare providers. So... It's just That's right. It's, the, yes, the fears might be myths, it? like yeah, the breast yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah, it might not even be true. Yeah. No, but there's so many myths out there when it comes to birth. There are so many. There's so much mis- miseducation out there from movies and just stuff online. It drives me insane, and I'm not going to start ranting again. Like, <laughs> we don't mind. Is... <laughs> we like a good rant. Well, we were at a networking function recently, and we were the minority. There was, like, no women there, and just Natasha and I holding it down for their for our females. <laughs> and we actually had a gentleman come up, um, and he started ranting about how not only is the media giving terrible information, but he's, like, so, was so worked up. I've never, like, he sounded like, you know, how we all get worked up in our industry. <laughs> Um, about the the 
terrible peer support that's happening. Like, you know, your neighbor tells you or your sister tells you based on faulty, you know, something crappy that their healthcare provider told them. And it just spreads like through Facebook mom groups and at meetups. And he was like so passionately getting upset about this like misinformation that just spreads through the mom tree. And it was like, Natasha, I just kept watching him. Like, this, like, this oh, guy I, in tech. I need him on the like, podcast. Give me his I name. Know. You should have heard him. I was like, I have never, A, been at a, like, mostly male networking thing and had a man, like, as worked up, like, splotchy necked like we get. He's like, it's just this misinformation and we just keep passing it on and telling other women and it's got to stop. I don't know how to make it stop. And I was like, and you're in tech? <laughs> yes. Wow, that, that is some enlightened man. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> I know, it was amazing. He's building apps. Yeah, he builds apps for like oh, something he, um, not related to maternal yeah. health. So yeah. I was like, you could build an app for us. Yeah, yeah, anytime, anytime. So in terms of just thinking about anything else that we haven't talked about when it comes to body image then and women that, you know, what, what, what else could you share that can help or inspire maybe a pregnant woman listening who has worries about her body changing and how or how she's feeling about her body maybe she's sort of feeling a little bit down as a result of that is there anything else you can share that can maybe inspire her with hope and confidence that's a really good question it is a very good question i think it all really does come back to this idea that we want to be doing things now to nourish ourselves and love ourselves rather than punish ourselves for being a certain size so many of us grow up just punishing ourselves like being like I'm gonna go for a run because I ate a piece of pie this morning like you know what I mean yeah. did you yeah. eat pie for breakfast I didn't have pie for breakfast <laughs> I wanted to though because I had to go through the McDonald's because I didn't have enough time and they had a new banana chocolate pie <laughs> Um, but I didn't get it. But what I'm saying is like, you know, punishing yourself because I did this. So now I have to only eat this. Yeah. Like being able to throw that out the window now. Like this is this is a, a reset for like how yeah. we've been feeling about ourselves. Like yeah. that's what I wish people would take on. Although I know it's way easier said than done. So really loving. I mean, I, again, easier said than done. But really loving your body. You're growing a person or people, depending on how many you have in there. <laughs> And I mean, that's a really amazing thing. And no matter how many babies that I've seen be born and placed on their parents' chest, like I still hundreds of times I've been there. And every time I'm like, I can't believe that was just inside that yeah. body. I know. Like it's never not like awe inspiring. I don't even have yeah. words. Like they all just sound too trite for like that miracle moment. And And I really like I know that we use that language like you're it's it's miraculous you're growing a person so love it everything that you put in your body even if it is pie like be like I'm loving this and this is something that feels really good for me and I'm eating this for me and my baby you know and hopefully you'll you'll throw some greens in your mouth as well but like whatever your choices are like just feed and act and like love you know everything from a place of love and and it will change the energy around it because mm -hmm. it isn't just you and it will never just be you going forward like mm -hmm. That, that motherhood journey, like it starts with pregnancy and it does come with changes, but your whole life is going to change. Mm -hmm. You're every, there's not, there's nothing ever the same. We change at a cellular level, becoming parents. Um, so it's, it is really important to understand that this is just a, one of the rites of passage. Um, and it's, you know, it's a beautiful rite. And, and I'm, and this is really like, I know I really struggle. I'm vain as get out. Like I'm the vainest <laughs> person ever. So I know I'm like, just love your body and it's fine. Like I stand in front of the mirror and do my like terrible script and then remind myself not to do it at least five times a day. So, but it is, I do think about those things. Like, mm. you know, my breast did change, but I breastfed my, my daughter for four years and like that was a gift wow. and now she's, you know, she's... Your breast changed in pregnancy though. They did. They actually were shockingly like awesome and they just started going down in the last couple of years and my daughter reminds me like every shower, like, mom, your boobs look so much lower. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Gray. Thank you. Um, so it is It is a really important message that we, we need to keep doing with each other because women are the hardest on one another and themselves. I know we want to blame other people, but it's really, it's ourselves and our yeah. own communities. Um, I, I'm half French, so I'm blessed with the French attitude to food, which is, it's delicious, eat it. Don't deprive yourself. But the great thing about French culture as well is it's not about going crazy and indulging to the point that you're 
excessive with it. And so I use this a lot, you know, because I the whole idea of depriving myself of something that's going to be delicious that I enjoy, I just won't stand for that because life is there to be loved and appreciated. And if you live a life of deprivation, what kind of life is that? So I'm not going to deny myself the chocolate. I'm not going to deny myself the thing, but I'm going to have a small piece and then the next time I eat, I'm going to eat something healthy and I'm going to always balance it. So if I'm going to have a nice thing, I'm going to balance it with something really healthy. And I exactly. trade I trade myself. So I go, yeah, I've eaten the chocolate. So now I'm going to eat something really good. Or I'm going to go and have a glass of water. I'm going to go and walk around the block. I trade, So I use that to help me. So it means I always get to have what I want, but I always make sure I've got to balance it with something else. And it's got something else. So I kind of feel like I'm getting the best of both worlds in that sense. So I'm, I'm just sharing that because that might be helpful for somebody listening. Because yeah. I, I just totally don't like the idea of, well, I'm, I'm not going to eat any ice cream now I'm pregnant because it's bad. It's like, no, eat the ice cream. Just make sure you go for a walk after the ice cream, you know. Just balance yeah. it up and kind of make sure you're not being silly with it, you know. Be sensible. But anyway, anyway, this is not a nutrition I love podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I love ice cream. I love food. And the last piece, too, I really want to make sure that if, if people are going into their pregnancy – um, and they are plus size or, you know, whatever, um, words they like to use for their own body, um, to make sure you're surrounding yourself around people who are using words that build up your confidence and make you feel good about yourself and, you know, support you through your pregnancy rather than people who use fear mongering or, or shameful or damaging wording. Um, because th that is not going to help your body image, right? Like surround yourself with good people and kind people absolutely lovely brilliant 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 now this has been absolutely fabulous where can people find out about your amazing online business where can they find you online where can they find you on facebook all that good stuff well uh you can find us online at babomia.com so b-e-b-o-m-i-a.com and you'll be able to find our trainings and we actually have a gift for your listeners oh exciting um if you use the code fearfree 20 um, you can have 20% off any of our courses and programs. And we have lots that, I mean, they run all year round. So that will be good anytime. Um, you can also check us out on Facebook at forward slash Babel Mia Inc. Um, we always have really great dialogues, Facebook lives that go on regularly. Um, lots of activity and, and community there as well. Brilliant, brilliant. And Babel Mia, just tell the listeners where that <laughs> name's from. Because I did ask before we started chatting. So just share where that's from. Well, it's Esperanto, which is a universal language that doesn't have any association with a nation. Um, and we thought it was very clever of us because <laughs> we were, you know, almost a decade ago coming up with our name. We wanted something that was going to be neutral because we also had a fertility element to our business. So we didn't want to have a name or images that would be, you know, upsetting for families trying to conceive. Mm. So it means my baby in Esperanto because we thought, well, my baby, a baby is part of the trying to conceive the pregnancy or the postpartum period. Um, we thought we were very witty at the time. Yeah, we, we've, yeah we've, we've since learned that being clear <laughs> is more important than being clever, extremely clever. Um, but now we've, you know, the name has grown on us and we really like it. And we're, you know, we hope it rolls off the tongue like Lululemon or Starbucks <laughs> or something like that. You know, something that makes no sense. Um, we're not but you have, a, you have a successful business, so I think you, the, 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 there it is. You don't need to worry. <laughs> we'll wait till we're publicly traded, and then we'll be like, ha ha, Babel Mia made so much sense. <laughs> really? Well, listen, thank you, Bianca and Natasha, for coming on the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. It's been absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so for much having for having us. Hello, you've just been listening to me, Alexia Leachman, on the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. Now, this is just a wee reminder that if you're looking for more help, support and guidance on your fear-free journey to motherhood, then visit fearfreechildbirth.com, where you can find fear clearance meditations, online birth prep courses, training for birth professionals, a membership community and programmes for overcoming tocophobia. Until next time, bye for now.